freaking first cut. Golly! Welcome to the First Cup Podcast. I'm Rick Gaiman, and this is your recap episode for this week's Valspar Championship. Joining me to break it all down, Greg Ducharme is here. Hi, Greg. Hey, boys. What what a week. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm excited to talk about this one because there were some really interesting things that happened. Also excited to talk about Kyle's hat. The Reds. Didn't expect yeah, to see that today. Uh, Kyle Porter, if you're only listening to the audio version, is sporting a bright red, looks brand spanking new, Cincinnati Reds cap, in which uh, he told us why he's wearing it. Kyle, welcome. And why are you donning that cap, please? Yeah, I'm a big Ellie De La Cruz fan. And uh, and also, my 10-year-old is the... Uh... Is the fifth grade fifth grade Reds? So we had a big big first game today. Uh, got the got the dub. I'm the head coach. So man, fitted hats by the way, uh, Rick. When we were growing up, they're cheaper than they are now. My God, we had like styrofoam hats. Like they were the worst. Ha- I don't even know what they were made of. They weren't even made out of like normal material. They were the nasty <laughs> things. But even like the the like when you got into high school and college, you started wearing fifty nine fifties or whatever. They used to be like twenty five thirty bucks. Now they're like. 45 bucks. Oh, wow. Do do they still assign? Okay. Are numbers still assigned by size of the Jersey? Like is number one, the smallest Jersey that you guys have number two. No, no, you can, you can print. We, we actually printed our own numbers. So like my son picked 99 cause he loves judge. Um, my other son who doesn't play, but he got a Jersey. He got 53 for, um, uh, Adolis Garcia. So it, it's just whatever. One kid's 83. What, what would have to happen for you to get run from a game? You know, you have to get out there. You have to around, you get in the umpire's face. I the, that will that will not happen. That will not be happening. Uh, <laughs> if I get run from a fifth grade youth ba- recreational baseball game, then we've got some pro- we've got some issues. Yeah, that's for sure. Wow, the I umpires, got- the, the umpire, the, I I actually have so much empathy for the umpires. It's so so difficult to <laughs> call balls and strikes to like the the balk situation is atrocious nobody knows how to come set everybody's moving all the time they're they're basically like coaches half coaches half umpires so it's it's everybody's kind of on the on the same team so th- this is the first year of uh kids pitch yeah yeah for, we're actually playing up a grade because we had like half fifth we had a couple fifth graders so a lot of our fourth graders are playing up so they're playing in a league where kids have played kid pitch before, but they haven't. So it's a little, it's kind of a new, new experience. Okay. I did buy a fungo bat, which has been fun. That's sick. All right. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to hear about uh coach Porter and how he rallies the troops throughout a long <laughs> summer of uh baseball. Dog days. The dog days. <laughs> it's going to be so good. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, listen, gents, there's madness going on the basketball courts. There's madness going on on our golf courses. There's madness happening in fifth grade baseball. It's just an absolute insane world we live in. And we've got another long shot winner on the PGA Tour. His name, Peter Malnati. And Greg, entering this week, he was 325 to 1 to win. He fired a four under 67, including coming in with a 31 on his second nine to capture his first victory in over nine years. A a really nice performance from him today. And he hit some big shots, some big shots early in that back nine. The shot at 17 is is definitely the shot of the tournament uh, where he hit it in there to six feet. You know, that's the winning moment which which you need to have but look this is a career peter malnati is a 100 to 150 player on the pga tour uh, in th- this week alone he made more money and official money than he ever did in his pga tour career for a season which i found to be incredible so he's been this journeyman he's he's always kept status out there he's always been able to to play but he hasn't really contended. He hasn't really been in the mix of these events. And now all of a sudden he's clearly put some work in because there have been some improvements over the last couple of weeks. I wasn't sure that it was something that would lead to a win, 
He shot 81 in the final round last week. I, I know he did. 66 81 with an eagle. Yeah. Yeah, it's tough. But like he plays really well at the cognizant and he played well at the players until the 81. So I, I guess all I'm trying to say is there's been some signs. Some things have looked a little better. Uh, it's been turning in the right direction. It's clear to me that he's been putting in a lot of work. You know, Brad Faxon was saying on the broadcast throughout the week that he, I, I'm I'm unclear on this, whether he has gotten off the policy board or wants to get off the policy board, uh, but he's discussed that uh, on a, a number of occasions. And the reason for that is he wants to put more time into his game. So I wonder if he's been doing that already over the last couple of weeks, um, making some improvements because, yeah, he looked he looked ready to go. He he looked like a player who's been putting in work and felt like this was his moment, and he took it, which was which was awesome to see. It obviously meant a lot to him. I think everybody wants off the policy board at, at this point. That's a different conversation. Uh, KP, this is this really is kind of a bubble bubble boy situation. Every year of his career, every full year of his career, he has finished between a hundred and fourth. No, I'm sorry. I'll give him a little bit more credit. 86th and 167th of the FedEx Cup standing. So just that like next level of golfer, as Greg mentioned, uh, this is going to pile on to the, the career earnings. It's going to jump him up in the FedEx Cup points. He's probably going to have the best finish uh, of his career. And I don't know. I didn't I didn't really see it coming. No, I mean, so a couple of things. One, if you've if you've been wagering like a thousand bucks on Scotty Scheffler and everybody that's 200 to one or longer this year, you're a billionaire. You're like the richest person in the country. That's retired. Yeah. Uh, two, I was texting somebody during the final round about how like there might not be two more disparate uh, statistical profiles than Cam Young and Peter Malnati. <laughs> I bet their ball speed is like 25, 20, 20 miles an hour different. You probably, ha you probably can I'll go find, find that real quick, but yeah. Malnati's uh, 285 on many of these tee shots. I know. And I, I just, I mean, we can talk, we can break down the round or talk about the specific shots, but I, I thought his interview afterwards was, was extraordinary. I mean, I thought it was, I thought it was amazing. And um, I think that, you know, the part to me that really stood out was, he was just talking about how like the, the quote that I think people are going to kind of, eventually like run to is he he said life is hard it's obviously glamorous at times like this this is my dream job and it's absolutely amazing but life is really really hard too when you're trying to figure out how to live this lifestyle and have two kids and be everything you want to be it's really hard and i think you know the thing that has gotten glam um gla glamorized is that i don't know if that's a word but the thing that has been like sort of lionized over the last couple of years is like oh well where can i go and make the most money and and you know who's who's paying the most and where can I, how can i make more and more and be like am i making am i getting my value am i am i economically viable and it's like yeah that, that might not be the 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 most important thing it might not be the first lens that we should kind of look at all of this through and i th i thought that what malnati said was like a better way to look at things like am i thriving as a human like life is hard, even for people that are, I don't know how much you made today at 1.5, whatever the number was, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Like that doesn't make life. I mean, it makes it more, um, makes it easier in some ways, but it makes it harder in a lot of ways. Like how can I get my kids to thrive when we're traveling 35 weeks a year? Those are the types of things that I think nobody really ever considers or thinks about that these guys do. And I just, I, I just really appreciated that. I thought he was incredibly vulnerable and I, I really loved that post round interview because it was the antithesis of so much of what we've seen over the last couple of years. Yeah. He's the right level of successful without me rolling my eyes and being like, okay, bud, like life is really hard for you. Sure. Sure. It's like, he's like the, he's the perfect spokesman for that level of golfer. And he's always been a great quote. So yeah, no, it was awesome to see him. Awesome to yeah. see what he can say afterwards. Yeah, you're you're like in one of these positions where you make a, a a nice sum of money every year, but it's not enough to retire and walk away and feel like you're going to be fine. You're not. It's not set for life money like a lot of these guys with fifty million dollars of 
career earnings. And so he has to put in a tremendous amount of effort just to stay on the tour. And you get a sense that, well, he, he does because he wants to do this job. Right. And it's not easy at all. Like that life at the bottom of, of the tour is a real challenge because it's so frustrating. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you walk in there and we look at a lot of these PGA tour events, like there's 20 guys who can win, you know, it's a very narrow window of, of players with the real ability to win. But weeks like this remind you that everybody in the field thinks that they can win and is really trying to, or at least there's players at every level, you know, whether you look at DraftKings pricing or, uh, or the odds boards, there are guys at every, every level, every rung, that really think they can win. Uh, and he was a great example of that this week. The second nine was eventful for a lot of reasons. Uh, we will go into that and more the rest of this field and everything else that happened. But first, we're going to take a quick break and hear a word from our partners. It's time for the madness. And CBS Sports HQ has your wall-to-wall -wall NCAA tournament coverage. We got your game highlights, expert analysis, and insights all the way to the final four. Start and end your March Madness coverage with CBS Sports HQ. And we're back. The second nine for Peter Malnati started with three straight birdies, 10, 11, 12, piled them up, and then he entered the snake pit, uh, 16, 17, 18. He hits his approach on 16 long KP into a horrid lie. And now here's, here's the moment of the tournament. The yeah. guy who's trying to win for nine years has just hit it into an awful spot on the first hole of an awful stretch. Is he going to be able to get up and down? Is this where the wheels fall apart? Cam Young, who's trying to break through for the first time ever, is nipping at his heels. This is the, this is the moment of the event. And we didn't get it because Peter Malnati exercised correctly his right to a drop from a sprinkler head. Mm -hmm. And the area in which he took his relief plus one club length gets him from nasty, thick, rough behind the green to fringe of the putting surface. It becomes a pretty straightforward two putt for par. Malnati moves on. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't love it. Uh, I, it's not nothing against him. It, it he, I mean, he even said it in the uh, on the on the as it was happening. He said, "This is a this is an amazing break, and I want to make sure I I don't I'm not taking advantage of it." Which I thought was kind of cool. I mean, like I I think he handled it like very appropriately. Uh, I was actually thinking as this happened. So Kevin Van Valkenburg uh, no lineup has a take that one tournament a year should be like you ha you cannot take any drops you have to play every ball as it lies which is would be awesome like with all the grants like sorry like just once a year you're playing everything as it lies and I actually kind of feel like something like this this is like well outside of this tournament and his situation but I almost feel like they should just play stuff like this as it like you don't want to be on a on the top of a, a sprinkler head like don't hit it there you weren't trying to hit it there and you you mess that up like that's a that's a sucky break like you shouldn't have hit it there uh maybe that's that's probably like dumb and sort of half-baked and probably pretty unfair but I, I that was just what came to mind as i was watching it but yeah i mean i thought everything was adjudicated properly and he did all the right stuff. It was just, it was an extraordinary break because the ball was, it wasn't a good lie. And maybe he gets up and down, maybe not, but the putt, the two putt was fairly straightforward uh, from what I could tell on, on TV. Yeah. I don't think anybody's, uh, no one's calling Peter Malnati a cheater. He literally in the moment was like, I, I want to make sure this is, this is going right because every, this is outstanding for me. And yeah. It's the rule, the rule. Now, my my big thing here, uh, Greg, is you know, if you do if you do want to get relief from standing on a sprinkler head, fine. I don't care. My thing has always been I don't like it when guys can get from one cut to another cut. I, you go from the rough to the fringe, or yeah. like if you if you're in the rough, you should have to stay in the rough. And if you can't find proper relief there, then you have to stand on a sprinkler head. 
you know, if you're in a bunker, you got to stay in a bunker. If you're on the green, you get to stay on the green. I just, I don't like the being able to change from surface to surface. Like they wouldn't allow that. They would not allow that in a scramble that I play on Saturday at the club. I would take my one, you know, my one club head or my one club length in the same cut. I think we can do it on the tour. R real quick, Greg. Uh, this happens at the open sometimes where, where they get a, you get a drop from grandstand, get the grandstands or whatever. And they have like a special drop zone that's a horrible lie. And so you're like, oh, well, yeah, that that's actually, you should have to, if you want relief from something like that, you you shouldn't get a better lie than where you, where you, I mean, it's, a, that's sort of a different situation, but it's the same concept, I guess. I love the, I love the way they do that at the open. Yeah. Just, it, it definitely, it seems right. Um, look, I'm sure that, uh, and I'm not as well versed in this as I'd like to be. I'm sure there's a purpose for the rule being the way it is. I'm sure there's a situation out there where, um, where there's not really an option. But I, I do feel like those should be exceptions because I, I tend to agree with you. You hit it into the rough. That is so well defined on the PGA Tour. You know the the various cuts of rough uh, in professional golf are very well defined. Uh, and there, there's not really a, a good reason that I can think of, of, of why you should be moving to a different surface because you're standing on something. And so it, it doesn't seem like it just doesn't seem right. It doesn't feel right. Even though he calls a rules official over and absolutely makes the right play. But part of the reason he calls the rules official over is because it doesn't feel right. You know, he, he makes that comment. This is a great break. I just want to make sure I'm doing this the right way. That's because it doesn't feel right. You know, because all of a sudden you're you're putting and you hit, you're playing from a spot that you didn't hit it into. So I completely understand you, Rick. I, I'm sure in the defense of the USGA and the PGA Tour, more so the USGA, there's there's very likely a scenario in in all of golf in the total realm of golf where it's very difficult to determine the differences between cuts. So you just take your nearest point of relief. It's a simple way. It's a very simple solution. Um, but, it, but in the golf that we play out on the PGA tour, I, I don't think it would be a bad thing to have a, a separate rule because, because the conditions are so well-defined. The good news is that he stood up on 17, the 200 yard par three stuffed one and made the putt, which was, which made me feel a lot better than about the whole situation, because I think it would have been a lot, a lot different if he limps to the finish line, beats Cam Young by a shot. And we're all looking back at the drop he took on 16. Yeah. He, he yeah. definitely stepped up and won the tournament. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I, I think, I mean, you're right though. Like it doesn't, Again, this is not this is nothing against Peter Malnati. It's more just a golf situation, like a, a rules and a golf situation that is, you know, it's it's part of the deal. Like it, I think I think what would be crazy is if something like that happened to to determine a and maybe it has, but to determine like a major or like the players last week. Like what what if what if that happens with you know Wyndham Clark or Xander or Scotty or whatever. And you're like, oh man, that that feels that's tough. Like that's tougher to to swallow than like, oh well, maybe this thing would have affected Peter Malnati's two stroke win. Like that's just a very different thing than affecting a major championship. Agreed. Couple of uh, items here on Peter Malnati. First off, uh, last night on the show, uh, I I tempted fate, and we skipped Peter Malnati, and I said, go win, Peter. You know, if you win, we'll be able to talk about you a lot. But we're oh yeah, gotcha. Uh, on Saturday night. Congratulations, Peter. Well done. I will, uh, I will eat crow at this moment. And then, what, I mean, what a, what a round to go from 81 last Sunday to 67 this Sunday to beat real horses. Yeah. I mean, when Xander posted early, uh, there was a number to beat. And then if it did kind of feel like this was going to be the cam young one, if it wasn't going to be the cam young one, it was, it was wide open. And Peter said, I'll take it. Yeah, I kind of felt like Mac Hughes was was at, at points on Saturday and even going into Sunday. I was like, I kind of, I kind of think, I actually thought I actually wrote Keith Mitchell on on Saturday night, but I thought if not him, then maybe Mac Hughes. 
Yeah. And both those, I mean, Mitchell obviously faded and was not good on Sunday, but Mac Hughes, uh, he was kind of there until he hit it in the water on what was that? Uh, 14, 15. Where do you hit it? Uh, 13. 13. Okay. For a second straight, for a second straight vote. Yeah. Um, the other item before we move on is Cameron Young's ball speed average this year 181.2. That's okay. 16th on tour. Peter Malnati, 172.4. That is 101st on tour. Okay. That's better than I would have. I, I, I would have thought he was more around 165, but there's probably not a ton of guys around 165. Uh, there is uh, 165 would be. 168th on tour and there's only 178 qualifying golfers so you'd be in the bottom 10 on tour at 160. Yeah. brian how Harman, old is brian Harmon's at 165. that's crazy brian Harmon's a he's he's a dog uh literally and figuratively how old is malnati like 34 36 36 okay what a, well i mean to get in the mat uh, I, you know, you, you get into the masters when you're 22 and you're like, yeah, of course, like I'm, I'm the man because that's what you think when you're 22 to get in the masters when you're 36 and you have two kids and you've like lived a little bit of life and, and you have been on tour for 10, like that, that's, that's awesome. Like they'll be able to do the par three and really, I mean, it, it's just. That's a, that's a very different deal than like Ludwig playing in the masters this year. Uh, yes, it is. This will be his fourth major championship. It'll be his first Masters. He's missed the cut, the 2016 PGA, missed the cut, the 2021 PGA, missed the cut, the 2021 US Open. Also playing in the Masters this year will be Cam Young, Greg. And I would like to do a little bit of a temp check on Cam Young, who went 69, 69, 68, 68. His second nine had birdies on 11, 12, and 14, but he played his final four holes at one over, and this will now be his seventh runner-up finish to go along with zero career PGA Tour victories, level of concern being where? Uh, you know, concern is a funny thing. I mean, last night we talked about this, and I said I didn't think he was ready in large part because of his short game. I still think there's a weakness there. He made some nice, really nice up and downs today, um, but a, a lot of it's with the putter. Like he made a, he made some nice par saving putts from 11, 15 feet in that range uh, that were big. Now that's a really good sign in a lot of ways because he knows how to compete. He knows how to put himself in the mix. Uh, so I do think I, I still think the short game needs to get a whole lot better. Just watching him like the shot at two. I'm not saying he's going to get this up and down, but he's got like 35 yards and fats it short of the green. And, and those are the kind of things that guys that win major championships and don't they don't do that. He has the upside to overcome that and nearly win. You stand on the 18th tee with it with a chance to win. Birdie at 18 gets him in a playoff and and might win outright because of the way the timing stands up. So, look, I, I thought ultimately Cam, Cam Young played some really good golf. Uh, the birdie at 12 was huge. He took care of the par fives on the back nine, which was a big deal. And he, he just needed he needed that one shot. He needed the winning moment that Peter Malnati got. Cam Young didn't. And of course, the situation and the three putt on 18 is very disappointing. But this this isn't far away for him. He's a he's a big shot away from winning this week. It was a good week, KP. It was. He gained throughout the bag in a big way. He he gained three strokes to the field and in all four categories on Sunday. But yet, it still felt like he did not get enough out of the round. Yeah, I think so. Two things. One, I I think we would, <clears throat> I think we would think about Kim Young differently if he had already won, yeah. right? If like let's say he had won that Open in twenty twenty two or the PGA in twenty twenty two or just something, we'd be like, oh man, Kim Young, man, he's playing well. I think he's going to win the Masters. Whatever. I actually picked him to win the Masters at the start of the year. 
but because he hasn't won, it's like, oh, man, is he what's what's going on? You know, what's what's the deal? And then I think the other thing is I didn't I don't know that I realized, Rick, how good he was hitting it this year. He's been he's he, he's had a weird year in terms of finishes, but it's almost all correlated to his putting. I mean, almost everything. Like if you if you go down the list of his good finishes, it's just weeks where he's been good with the putter and his bad finishes. It's weeks when he's been bad with the putter. Now, they've been kind of extreme, like he's had a bunch of like top eights and a bunch of like 70ths or 65ths. And so that that part has felt, I think, just a little odd, but it's just so correlated to uh, to his putting um, that. I, I think you walk away feeling optimistic, but also like, yeah, yo, like when when is he gonna win? You know, I think I think that's sort of the prevailing feeling from people that are that have been paying close attention to Cam Young for the last couple of years. Uh one one thing on that, KP, like if we would feel different if he had won, we would also feel a lot different if he had never really contended. You know, it's only his third year on tour. And because there's been so many close calls and he's been yeah. in the mix in majors, it, he's on the front forefront of our minds. But if, if this was like Chandler Phillips, you know, a coming out party where all of a sudden you're contending for the first time, we'd look at this game and say, um, okay, this guy's got it. He's already proven to us that he's got it. So now we're waiting for the, the next big step. Yeah. Well, it's, it's kind of like, well, what, what are you, are you a star? Are you a, guy that's going to win i mean it's a little bit the xander question at times maybe less so than xander because xander's been doing it for a, a lot longer and at a higher level but but like yeah what are you like do we need to critique you as a star or are you just like just a, like a, a charles howe type where you're gonna like make 40 mil or 70 mil but not really win that that much and not really be a star or superstar. I, I don't know that we know what Cam Young is, and we're kind of trying to figure that out. And it's hard to figure it out with such a small sample size, which is sort of what you're saying. Speaking of never really contending, Xander Shockley finished at eight under par, a tie for fifth, thanks to a splendid Sunday 65 and early clubhouse leader. Uh, I think he was done when the final group was on the fourth or fifth hole, something of that nature. Greg, this is a uh, this is this is garbage time. This is padding your stats. This is going to look very good on the profile uh, when we when uh, when I upload that on on Monday. But Xander Shoffley did not sniff contention for one second of this event. No, <laughs> he gets a T five out of it. Look, this is um, it could be looked at as a a, a bad thing or an eye roll, but I just watched this guy and he is so good. I, I marvel at how, how good he is at the game of golf. Uh, he's unbelievable. I mean, he had 11 birdie putts today inside of 15 feet. So one thing he is working on his golf swing. He's making some changes in his golf swing and last week. He was very clear about this. He was making it work with the scrambling. Um, this week, it didn't quite work as well until today. So, I mean, that this could give him some pretty serious confidence um, with the new direction that he's going in. Unless he just completely bailed on it all and w went back to normal. I don't think that happened. So uh, there's definitely a confidence boost with Xander. And because he's been in contention this year and played so well this year, it feels like he should be on the precipice of winning, but I'm not sure that he is at that level with his swing in his own mind. So ultimately, I, I think this is a really, really good sign for Xander, who's working on improving his game and, and making changes to do it. And that can take some time to work through. So I think this is a, a big step for him. Greg, it, it seems a little bit like, he's the swing is good but it it it's not necessarily good under pressure right now is that is that a fair way to say it and and if and if so then why do you think that is um so we created this thing for amateurs called the levels of performance 
Uh, there's basically seven levels of performance when you're developing a skill. And a, a level one player, for instance, can make the motion. Let's say you're trying to get your left wrist in a bowed position. Um, you can make a golf swing and you can bow your left wrist. That's a level one player. Level two player can do it with a golf ball there. But a level three player can do it with a golf ball there to a target on the range. A level three player can do it uh, to a target with a ball there on the golf course. And, and it goes on until basically, you know, a level seven player can do it on Sunday to win a, a championship. So there are varying levels of performance and Xander's clearly at a level where he can do it in tournament competition and he can do it to a target. But when it's a chance to win an event like the players championship, uh, it's a lot more challenging. And, you know, most players don't ever get to that level in their entire career. Yeah. I think Xander has been at that level. Um, although right now I don't think he is. What's what's the what's the change? Because at the players, it reminded me a little bit, Rick, of of what we were seeing with. Uh, remember, we saw Hovland at uh, Phoenix last year, and Just you're like, full on grind mode. He's he's grinding his his face off, and then he almost wins two majors, mm -hmm. and that's a little bit what it felt like with Xander at the on the right. Like I wasn't at the players, obviously, but just watching seeing him on the range it looked like he was just so like deep in the process what what is, what is there a specific change there Craig yeah um his coach Chris Como came on uh on the radio show that I do or last week I was talking about it and basically Xander has a tendency to get the club a little laid off at the top of the backswing okay. which means the the club lays down a little flatter yeah. and they're trying to work the club a little more uh upright so it points more down the target line yeah and that helps him straighten out his ball flight a little bit and so at times he gets it at other times he doesn't that's the simplest way to explain it so it's just a little bit of a different pattern yeah but look i've seen xander do stuff like this before when when he was um when he was playing in the u.s open in 2020 i was I really I wanted to pick him. I think I did. And there were some people on the range there because there were no fans. Some people on the range were reporting to me like Xander is lost. He's hitting it miles right and miles left on the range before he goes out and finishes T5. Had a chance on Sunday. So I, I do think there's part of him that just knows how to go put a score on the board. Yeah. Uh, even if he's uncomfortable with the swing, which is admirable. Yeah, that's that's super interesting. I think Luke Kerdanine had something on that laid off versus down the line thing on on Twitter. He he showed some, and maybe they showed it on Golf Channel too from last year of just his his position at the top uh, compared like last year or maybe two years ago compared to this year, and it did it did look very different. So that's that'll be something. I mean, especially going into major season, that'll be something because he's. I mean, honestly, Rick. I'll throw it back to you, but like he's been kind of the statistically the second best guy in the world this year. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, if, if, if they played a thousand rounds or a thousand hole championship, I would draft Scotty first and probably Xander second. And just because I know I'm just going to get like stuff like this is why it's so good in no cut events. It's why you're just eventually going to get it. This probably is the last time we see him, though, before the Masters. He's not in the field next week, and he has not played the Texas Open uh, since 2018. So probably the next time we see Xander is uh, Augusta, Georgia for the Masters. It doesn't feel like the Masters is that. I mean, I, I know like mentally it is, but it it feel it doesn't feel like it's that close. Two starts. Um, the final group is not immune to this conversation. We'll talk about them real quick, Josh. Then we'll hit the break and, and move on. But Keith Mitchell and Seamus Power, Greg, combined for 11 over par. Keith Mitchell started his day hitting one into a parking lot of sorts and didn't get much better after that. No, five fair. He hit five fairways today. Sorry, he only hit 10 greens. Uh, and this guy that was so on fire with his golf swing yesterday. 
And in previous weeks, I mean, in Mexico, he was awesome with his irons. Um, the Cognizant, he played pretty well, too. And this just, it all fell apart on him. The putting has been an issue for a while for Keith. Uh, it continued today, but ultimately he couldn't get the ball in play. And when you can't get the ball in play around here, it's a very challenging golf course. Not good, KP. No. Did we even see, like, it felt like the tournament ended when Malnati putted out? They, the They're only reason they showed, they did show uh, Mitchell's approach on 18 because he stuffed it to four. Okay. But yeah. That's the reason they, I don't think we saw Seamus finish up. I, I didn't. I, yeah. Producer Josh says, I don't think I saw Seamus hit a shot. I, I saw him once, maybe, I think. Like just sort of at the end of a of a shot, but I I thought Mitchell, you know, it was interesting. I, he was talking on Saturday about uh, hitting changeups, basically, which is a JT special where you like take speed off. And he he was kind of laughing about how it's taken him this long in his career to figure out how to take speed off of a approach, like off of a eight iron, nine iron wedge. And so I'm like, man, that that feels like something has a little bit clicked with his approach play because um, it's been very good this year, like really, really, really good. And I, I just thought he was going to go out and win on Sunday. And it, it, he, it was, it was tough. It was not good. Yeah. Ugly stuff, but uh, Keith Mitchell will uh, live to fight another day and we'll see him around the is bank. He, is he in the masters? He's gotta be right. Uh, let's see where he is in the OW. GR. I think he is. I, I think, think so too. Uh, he's not on. He's not on the list of 2024 invitees. Really? Where what? is he in the OWGR, Greg? Uh, looking. Looking. I probably could have just typed in his name and found it a whole lot quicker. 72nd. 72nd. Now, that's you. Not, this week, I mean, unfortunately, he just. He actually probably just lost his chance because even a, a second would have bumped him up. He's got to be in top what top 50, 50 after not after next week, after the week after. He was 75th at the start of the year. It, it might be after next week, Rick. I, I don't yeah. I, I was gonna say I thought there was a week. Like I don't think it's week up. Like I, it, it's not it's not Texas Open, top 50, you're and then you go to Augusta. I think it's after Houston. Here it is. It's the, the official the official criteria is the 50 leaders of the final official world golf rankings published during the week prior to the current masters tournament. So the week prior to the current masters tournament, that's not published till Monday. That's, that's San San Antonio, which, which would include the Monday, like you're saying, Kyle, but it would not include San Antonio. Yeah. Right. Only yeah. include Houston. So there is one week to go. So he's and then you could win San Antonio. Right. Right. So but he needed I mean this was a big day and like for his year and it didn't. What did he finish? Like T 30 20 something. <laughs> I I actually thought on I and I wrote this a little bit on Saturday like this felt like the most bunched up a board has been in terms of star power and scores and like I thought I thought like 20 people could win it on Sunday and <laughs> He finished T seventeen. Yeah, he finished seventeen. The birdie on the birdie on the last. He finished seventeenth. Okay. Okay, so he'll move up into the sixties, but he needs probably a top three or top five at San Antonio or at Houston. Yeah, could he could have got it done? Could have got. That's it done. a bummer. All right, um, we will return with our best bet recap. The one and done, just pillow fight that occurred this week brutal but first we're going to take a quick break and hear a word from our partners for the last four years i have been a prisoner of this hotel ah g sharp i believe why are they keeping you here why do they let you live most of my friends are dead my house was seized and burned you must never leave if you do i'll be waiting they can take away everything <laughs> but they can't take away who you are. And we're back. 
let's recap. That's surprisingly, no one had Peter Malnati on their outright card, but we did do okay with the rest of these. A push and two wins in the matchup department. Greg, you and Patrick both had the same one. Christian Bezadenhout over Aaron Rye. Bezadenhout actually rallied on Sunday. He finished T9, and Aaron Rye missed the cut. So that was sweat free for you. I love the sweat free ones. Uh, again, Christian now just comes in playing great golf. Uh, his iron play had been really quite good. And of all the players I was on, he was one of the few that really stepped up this week. Because this was this was a tough week in the picks. A lot of guys that looked really good coming in dropped the ball. But I'm, I'm glad Christian was able to uh, hold strong, play well, and get both Patrick and I a, a big win. Uh, Patrick went to his favorite wet socks, Xander Shoffley, to finish inside the top 10. And a Sunday of fire did just that. He finished uh, T5, and that cash is for Patrick. I had Andrew Novak to finish top 40 at plus 125, and he finished T17. So Andrew Novak put another good performance together. We had a variety of Sam Burns and Brian Harmon, Nick Taylor, Doug Gim to win. Uh, KP, I mean, this was it was kind of a just bloodbath of the top. I mean, Spieth missed the cut. Finau missed the cut. Burns missed the cut. Harmon missed the cut. Uh, JT ejected himself. Might as well have missed the cut. Yeah, it was it was not pretty for the top of the board. Uh, okay, so a couple of things. One, what is what is what is Spieth? Is Spieth a good player who's playing bad? A bad player who played good at the start of the? What what is he? What are, what are we doing? I don't know, man. It's just how do you answer that? I, well, I mean, that's what I'm saying. Like, I I don't really know. There's, the, I mean, fittingly, there's no precedent for what he is as a as a player. And and what I mean by that is like, there's no there's no precedent for winning three majors by the age of 24 or 23, and then basically becoming like a good but not like like when that happens when guys do that it's your tigers your hogan's your rory's i mean rory has not won a major in 10 years but he's still like a top like uh, he's been in the top 15 of the world golf rankings for like 13 straight years or something and he's Spieth probably been the best player since 2014 in the game yeah it's like him or rom right or Scotty's kind of entering that conversation. DJ's in it, D, you know, but like yeah, Brooks would be in it. There's just a weird, like there's no real precedent for somebody winning that much at that young of an age. And then really not being, he's not that guy. And I think we've known that for a while, but he's like, I don't even think he's the guy that we thought was coming out of the slump. And so I, I just I don't really know what to make of him, which is fitting again, because I think he doesn't know what to make of himself half the time. But and then the other thing is JT's putting on Saturday was just historically. I mean, it was I tweeted this. It was art like the, the line was just a work of art. You I mean, couldn't so even you couldn't you almost couldn't even try to have it be that bad. Correct. I was going to say for things to have to go had that right to be that bad where everything finishes, you know, within you make a two foot nine or two foot nine inch putt on the first. And then everything else that you miss finishes like within that. And you just tap it. Like it, it's, it's a lot of bad. It's a lot of bad luck. And it's a lot of bad putting. It was, yeah. it was special. It was true. It would, it it would be a, a real test of skill to go out there and try to finish 18 holes with less than 22 feet of putts made. It would be hard, legitimately hard, even for, for within your foot, even for an amateur. I'm, well, I'm saying right, and for anybody I, to try to do that would be it, it extremely is difficult because you might make some. Yeah, it is possible that I've never played a round of golf where two feet nine inches has been my longest putt made. I would say it's probable. Yeah, it's probable. Well, the thing is that you don't putt the putts inside of that distance. Oh, I, I, you'd be surprised how many oh, I, you, fin box. you finish them all out, Rick. <laughs> I more, more than I have, more than I should. 
I, I, I actually do too. Um, okay, good. But especially when I'm playing by my by myself, I, 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 I hate feeling like I shot whatever 81. I mean, it's they're terrible scores, but even like something in the 80s, but I gave myself like four putts. Like that feels gross. I'm oh, no, if I'm playing if I'm playing with other people, then I'll just if they give it to me, I'll usually take it unless it's egregious and then I'll put it. I, I'm much more likely to to pick up a 10 inch putt than I am a two and a half footer. Yeah, me too. Yeah, unless it's match play and it's conceded yeah. different, different game. Um, but but most people aren't really putting a two and a half foot putt. So if you make any putts during a round of golf, it's longer than that. <laughs> if it ever ends up in the bottom of the hole for, for most people, it's longer than that. He lost what? Seven strokes, Rick. Where, where did that rank on your, in your, in your database? So off the top of my head. So I have, so my database goes back to 2008. It's not the full shot link era, which is 2003. Um, yeah. So I have like 250,000 measured rounds. Not every round is a, a strokes game putting round. So out of 250 some odd thousand rounds, it was like the 35th worst. Oh, that's were, were others like PGA tour rounds or a European? These are the ones I'm referencing are only PGA tour rounds. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's crazy. The, the killer for me is like he had to shoot. He was five under after the first two rounds. Yeah. He had to shoot three under over the next two rounds to hit that top five. And it goes just like, well, you're looking at it. So, so here you go. So this is the, this is the worst putting rounds in my database. So Joe Durant in round two of the Wachovia championship lost 9.12. Look at the second one. Wait a second. Keith Mitchell shot 69 and lost nine strokes putting. That's no, his finish 69. That's his finishing position. Uh, okay. That would be sick. <laughs> this is, so how about this though? So Keith Mitchell, Round four of the 2021 Valspar had the second worst putting round ever. That was the that was the day his putter was bent. Remember that? Yeah, yeah. And then and then he, I mean, he had another bad round four of Valspar does not go well for Keith Mitchell. No, no. Yeah, this is. Yeah, I don't see anybody's name on there twice. I don't think. These are, this is kind of the the greatest hits though. It's, it's your <laughs> Kyle Stanley, Luke List, Lee Westwood, yeah. <laughs> Mitchell, Ben, uh, Boo Weekly, Ben. Otto. Yeah, like I was surprised I'm not on that list. <laughs> or yeah. I was going to be on that list. That's great. Whew. What a what a what a group. It's a tough scene. Yeah. Um, I had one other thing about. Oh, not that. Uh, I mean, FedEx Cup, like your final FedEx Cup standing is is pretty flawed or whatever, but I'm very surprised that I was just clicking through Jordan Speed's profile and he has not finished inside the top 10 of the season long FedEx Cup standings in six years. And he's outside of the top 30 right now. Is this like you're talking about after the tour championship or leading into the I believe this would be after the tour championship. This is his final standing. But I mean, you get your spot. I mean, I don't know. It just feels like it would be easier for him to because he should be better than everybody else, like be a top 10 player at the end of the year, any year. Yeah. Right. I think he, well, he's kind of been the, the tour championship bubble boy over the last five years. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like where he's there, there was that Greller meme where Spieth was like, but what if I made it uh, <laughs> at the BMW? I sure. Do you remember that? He was, they were staring at the computer and he's like, but what if I made it, which is definitely <laughs> going to come in handy at some point, but he's kind of, he's been on that 31st, 30th, 29th. Like he's, he's been right there rather than like the, you know, ninth, 10th, 11th, which is where he was at the, for the first four years of his career. Yeah. I expect Adam Shank to be the guy who finishes 33rd, 27th, 13th, 20th, 44th, 31st, not Jordan's beat. Right. Yes. Well, that's the whole deal. I mean, you just you just described the whole deal, right? Uh, best bets. 
one and two. Patrick had Justin Thomas to win. That did not happen. I had Bud Cauley to finish inside the top 30. That did not happen. Where did old Bud finish this week? He finished. Oh, he missed the cut. And then Sam Ryder, Greg, top 40. He had, he tied Xander Shoffley for the round of the day on Sunday to move up 37 spots to finish 33rd. What a hero. Yes, my finally. Like, what was he waiting for all week? Um, but what could I say? I, I called it. <laughs> he shot 70, he shot 78 on Saturday, and I was like, <laughs> you have got to be kidding me. He was the one guy that was for I was like, oh, maybe I'll get a you know a good finish out of one of my guys this week. And then he shoots 78. And then he answers the bell today. I was I was stunned. I, I actually didn't even see this until Josh texted me. And when he shot 65, he was like T39. And then I checked like 20 minutes later and he was T40. And then he ended up T33. So phenomenal round from him. And um, yep, another big win for the team. Yeah, we are as a team uh, a positive 8% on the bets. Which is pretty good. Yeah, outrights. They're helpful. Thanks, Patrick. Thank you, Patrick. One and done. I don't know, man. I mean, we the six of us combined for combined brutal thirty five thousand three hundred and sixty four dollars. Patrick won the week because Nick Taylor got him seventeen thousand nine seventy six. Josh finished second with Doug Gims seventeen thousand three eighty eight. While Greg, Mark, Kyle, and myself. Via Sam Burns and Brian Harmon got zero dollars. This just had to be a brutal week, and even the whole run your pool thing. Did yeah. any well on Naughty? Yeah, because you if you didn't have Burns, which I I, I was kind of hesitant to pick Burns because I thought everybody else would, but then I was like, I think it's so obvious that people will actually shy away from it. So I was fine with the pick. But if you didn't have him, you probably had JT or Spieth or something like that. And you, I mean, people just got destroyed. So there, there was no Mal Naughty selection. Thank goodness. Um, there was a, there were some, there were some Cam Youngs. Yeah, that m- would make sense. Sam Burns was the most popular. He missed the cut. Brian Harmon was the second most popular. He missed the cut. Nick Taylor and Doug Gim were third and fourth. We just referenced they did not crack 18,000. Christian Bezadenhout was 5%. And he got, I don't know what his what the amount that he got was, but he finished T9. And then Cam Young was 4%. He got uh, 800K. 800K. Something 9, like that. 915. Okay. So the the right play was probably uh, Poseidon out because I feel like Cam Young can make more than eight hundred thousand. It's just he, he's year. he's so inconsistent with where he finishes. It's hard to it's hard to if you get him in the right week, it's awesome, right? Yeah, but you know when you get into the playoffs, would oh, you yeah. rather? Yeah. You what, you get down to the end of the year and you need you haven't played anybody, and you have Cam Young sitting there. Cam Young can win any week. Yeah, according to Rick, I should pick Adam Shank. Apparently, playoffs. playoffs. Apparently, you should. The good news is, the big boy team remains in first, <laughs> which I'm happy about. Anne is in second. BA314, Mike M, Wine Lover, Johan, round out the top five. And I, I I was just scrolling down the list. Currently at 16th is my buddy Matthias from uh, Swedish TV. I sat next to him at the Ryder Cup. Nice. So Matthias Schwab? <laughs> Matthias Sandberg. <laughs> Could you okay. think I sat, sat next to Matthias Schwab at the, in the media center? In, in- you, you do all kinds of things that are... <laughs> That are crazy. What is the uh, amount? 16th. What's the amount? Yeah, he's got 7.6 million. He'd, he'd be smoking all of us. Yeah. Yeah, so there's a fall off even in the, the overall standings. 
I'm gonna Fred, you go from nine to seven six. It, it just interesting. How how did Mark get past us, Rick? Because he he picked Scotty Stinkin' Scheffler. I I could not I could not be more disappointed with where I picked Scheffler or both of us, you and I. <laughs> it could not have been worse. It's the lowest yeah. possible outcome. Yeah, brutal, brutal. It makes such a big difference the way it's set up. Thank you, Greg. Well, I, I've done that the past couple of years. I say it with true, genuine empathy. Um, it, but the spread it feels like we talk about this every week. Like the spread this week, it's it, you got Cam Young. It's eight hundred thousand for Peter Malnati. It's one point five. It's it's not a huge difference. But when you go from four and a half million to what what's second place at the players two million. That's yeah. a two, like a two and a half million dollar difference in one and done. That's enormous. So it's yes. just like you have to hit those events. And it's hard should, to do. We should have made people use their real names instead of hiding behind <laughs> these screen names. Although some of them are pretty good. You should have to do both. I was thinking we should use screen names. <laughs> yeah, <seriously. laughs> Aliases, actually. Yeah, yeah. Anonymous. Yeah, I would like I would like I would prefer that. There's there's one there's one team name called Speeth Impediment, which I thought was pretty creative. Uh there's one there's one was Thichter Hovland. Which I <laughs> That's thought, good. Which I, I like that. Which I thought was pretty good. So there's some I saw some, maybe last or may, I, I forgot where I saw this, but Sung J Him. <laughs> yeah. Which was yeah. good. There are some good ones out there. Okay. Uh, gents, any any final thoughts? We are headed to the Florida swing. We got uh we're we're or excuse me, we're headed to Texas. We're through the Florida swing. Like we said, it's only two more two more events until the big boy. Uh what do you want to touch on? Just seems like a very odd place because the big boys, not talking about run your pool leader. Uh, but but the big boys have a lot of question marks around them. Yeah. Uh, so I'm I'm looking forward to seeing what these fields look like the next couple of weeks, and you know what we're looking at here for a, a really important Masters, as they all are. Yeah, I think just to piggyback on that. Well, two things. One, I think we're in a situation where you could talk me into this being sort of the inverse of the last couple of years, where the non majors are kind of uh, not as compelling and the majors just rock like the players was awesome. Like it was extraordinary. And I wonder if some of the long shots and all this stuff happening at the non, this is, there's no like statistical evidence for this, but I wonder if it's leading to like, we get Brooks, Rory, JT Spieth in the final two groups at the masters. And you're like, Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm in, uh, so part of me is wondering that the other thing I wanted to touch on real quick, Rick, I can't get enough of this Otani story. I can't stop reading about it. Unbelievable. It's, it's um, stunning. What is your, what does your gut say is what actually happened? Oh, the I'm first story that they told, which is, uh, he, he was covering for his buddy's gambling addiction, but then they realized that it's apparently, I, I don't know if this, from everything I've read, it's illegal to wire a certain amount of money or whatever, which I didn't know, which we're expecting somebody that isn't even from the United States to know. I don't even know the laws in terms of like how, you know, the, the level of detail there. Yeah. And so I think it's, I don't know, a little unfair to not unfair, but it's, 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 it, it would make sense that somebody like that, that that's from another country didn't know those laws as well. And so I think that, once they found that out, then they had to start saying other stuff, and it just got messy from there. My, my lifestyle does not require me to know the <laughs> hiring. Well, like, neither does I. Don't <laughs> think Otani's does either. <laughs> and amounts that would become illegal, or who you send them to, or what state, or any of that. Uh, yeah, I think that's probably right. Uh, but here's the other thing, though: is is like if you're the bookie. Um, the only reason you would ever let this guy run up four and a half million dollars is because you knew yeah. Otani was good for it. 
Well, which maybe you were just I, maybe his interpreter said, "Hey, Otani's good." I, I don't know. I mean, who who knows what those those conversations were? Uh, my only hope is that somehow Phil is involved in all this. He probably is. I yeah. mean, California, lots of MLB gambling, bookie, like if, yeah. an illegal gambling ring in Orange County, California. Like that's probably Phil, <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> the other thing, there was one other thing, Greg. Um, so now after dragging their feet on this major league baseball has launched an investigation. I mean, does this, does this end with Otani being, I mean, this is literally on opening night, the face of your league who just signed the largest contract in sports. If, if this was a movie, I would think it was a BS plot line. Yeah. And I know so little about the whole game of baseball in general. Uh, let alone stories like this, but is he, I mean, he seems like a rock star of a guy too, right? Like, like that, that's, I think that's the part where if it was like, uh, I'm just going to pull in that, like Delonte West, you'd be like, Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> what a drive by. <laughs> well, I was, just, I was like, who's the worst athlete I could think of. I was just trying to think of somebody crazy. Like Delonte West seems crazy. I don't know. Yeah. Or like somebody who's been in trouble before. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You know, it, like Otani is a Jones, team like that. I don't, you know. Yeah. The guys but, get, getting arrested, all, you know, every other week, it seems like, or somebody like that. There are athletes like that. Who? Just allegedly getting, you know, getting, a, getting in trouble every week. Innocent, yeah. proven guilty. Um, yeah. It's a disaster for baseball. I mean, Otani is like a top five most famous athlete in the world. It's like Messi, Ronaldo, uh, LeBron, Otani, Tiger. And know. really, it's the one thing. It's the one thing you can't yeah. do. Like, it'd be better if he murdered somebody. <laughs> he, it would be way more like baseball would be way more lenient if Otani committed murder. Yeah, they'd be like, so hey, the, the thought is he's involved somehow, right? That's obviously like that's the is, fear. I don't know if it's the yeah. thought, it's the fear. Was this guy a cover up for him? Right. Yeah. It, this guy's definitely taking the fall for something. It's just a matter of like what that thing is. Oh. And they were like chopping it up in the dugout like hours before the story. Yeah. Came. You need to read, go read Nate Silver's piece on it. It's, it's good. The he's got a sub stack. The original, like, like, yeah, the original, you know, uh, statement and then the retraction, it, the whole thing is. I want to, we don't need to get into it now because I got to go eat dinner with my family, but uh, I want to hear your thoughts later, Rick, just about the state of gambling in general, because I think, I mean, it's, it's a big, I was talking with some friends about it yesterday. It, it's, it's like, man, I, it, <laughs> How, how does this go the right way? How does it go the wrong way? How does even golf like handle it? What like, I, I just, I think that would be a fun little segment for us to do on maybe on Tuesday, like before uh, Houston next week. Yeah. It's growing very quickly and there's a lot of like things that are happening, good, bad, and indifferent. And like, yeah, like, but like it's the, the, the animals out of the cage now. Yeah. And now, things can happen with the animals out of the cage. It's, it's, it's fascinating stuff for sure. All right. Well, we'll get to that at some point. Uh, big thanks to producer Josh who does all the hard work behind the scenes that right there. Greg Ducharme. You can find him on Twitter at the real GFD Kyle Porter. You can find him at Kyle Porter CBS, who, as we're talking about this gambling and baseball thing is wearing a Cincinnati Reds. Hat. <laughs> <laughs> like, I just love all of that. Money line, baby. Reds money line. You can find me at Rick Rungood. This has been the first cut. We'll catch you next time.